Walker coming to you from Watchmen Studios with another Watchmen video broadcast. Last week, we got into the story of Betty Andreessen, a woman who says that she is a born again Christian who has had multiple interactions with aliens, gray aliens, tall white aliens. I'm not sure if she met any dragon type aliens, but we know for a fact she's had interactions with gray aliens and tall white aliens. And where we left off last week was uh, what really got my attention about this whole alien thing was it related to the occult. And yes, we saw last week where Betty Andreessen, as a young girl, about 11 years old, sees this, she's outside, she's waiting for a friend to come over. She sees this blue orb circling her head. She thought it was a bee. It landed on her forehead right where her third eye would be. She says it bit her. You know how some people say a bee bit me. Well, they didn't really bite them. They stung them. And she said she felt squiggly things going into her brain. And she fell backward slowly and went into a trance. Then we connected that with the Masonic ceremony of the raising of Hiram Abiff. We associated that with being slain in the spirit. We associated that with Shakti Pot. Now, yesterday or a few days ago on Pastor Mike Online, I actually showed you a video of an Indian guru who was able just by his presence to bring Shakti Pot to his disciples or his followers. In other words, they you've got to see this video. They would come in, sit down. As soon as they got comfortable, boom. S serpent devils started taking over their body and they would all fall backwards. They would gyrate. They would uh, do all kinds of weird things. This guru had so much power that all he had to do was sit there. And when those people got in his presence, they became devil possessed. Shakti is, if you remember, the female goddess, along with Shiva, who is the male or androgynous god. And when the two come together, you receive Shakti Pat, Pata, in that Sanskrit language, I guess, means falling down or falling backward or falling away or whatever. And it's basically the falling away is what it is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, from Revelation chapter 6, when all the stars of heaven are going to fall, there's going to be a falling away that takes place, I believe, prior to the rapture. So I focused a little bit more, gave a little bit more of the background of this falling away and Shaktipat thing during Pastor Mike Online last week. If you have not seen it, I encourage you to go back and, and watch it, and then you'll get sort of the idea. Now, we're going to pick up the story in Betty Andreessen's life. This is from the books, the, the Andreessen Affair, Volume 1, The Andreessen Affair, Volume 2, which was written by Ray Fowler, and then a book that Betty and her new husband, uh, her name is now Betty Luca, they wrote together called Lifting the Veil. And it's in that book where she really starts opening up as to who the one is. And I'll go ahead and fast forward a little bit to tell you, she thinks that the one that she sees is the creator, Jesus Christ, God. Uh-uh. She was deceived. She is someone I believe that they hand selected because she believes that she is a born again Christian so they bring her into this whole UFO, alien, satanic, devil, fallen angels realm, I think, to persuade people who also think they're Christians into falling for this kind of stuff when it actually happens, when 
a third of the angels are kicked out of heaven and they're all going to come falling down to the earth. I think there's going to be a lot, a lot of church people who are also going to fall for that on that day. So let's pick it up where we left it off last week. Uh, Betty Andreessen, she is 11 years old. She has the bee thing, the blue orb hit her in the eye and she falls backward. Okay. But then they say, she hears a voice and she says she's too young. She's not ready yet. So now she has another encounter a year later when she is 12 years of age. This is from the Andreessen Affair book. Take a look at the screen. When Betty was 12, she had an encounter with a gray alien near her house. He pressed a button on his uniform and a small blue orb came floating out of it. The orb circled her head as when she was seven, landed on her forehead causing her to fall backward and go to sleep. She can hear in her head a conversation between the gray and another voice discussing that she has another year before she is ready. Now, when I show you the next slide, I'll show you what I think they meant by that. So take a look at this. This also is from the Andreessen Affair. When Betty was 13, after reaching puberty, she was abducted again, taken to a place she describes as a cavern of ice or crystal glass. She saw crystal coffin-like structures with people from throughout human history in a state of suspended animation, referred to in the book as what she called the Museum of Time, or what the aliens told her was a Museum of Time. When Betty asks where she is being taken, the gray tells her, we are taking you home. Now, uh, Bud Hopkins, John Mack, I just watched a video from those two. They were giving a lecture at Harvard uh, together. Those are the two guys who did the work on uh, the initial work on alien abductions. Bud Hopkins was an artist and a sculptor who got I don't know how he got interested in UFO abductees, but he started doing hypnotism on all these people who had been said had been abducted by UFOs. Then he got John Mack. John Mack's this esteemed Harvard professor who gets pulled into and is investigating hundreds of people who say that they have been abducted by aliens. And he writes a book called Abduction, and it gets him in a lot of trouble at Harvard. And but he stands by what he what he wrote and what he decided was that these people are not lying. They're actually telling the truth. There's something, whether it really happened or these things were implanted in their minds by devils, either way, these people were affected for the rest of their lives into either believing that they actually were taken by aliens into a ship or that idea was planted into their mind. Regardless, it changed these people for the rest of their life. And they're telling us that there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who probably have the same idea in their mind that they have been abducted by aliens and so forth. And here's what Bud Hopkins and John Mack and a lot of others have, they've all drawn the same conclusion that all of these human abductees taken by aliens or at least devils planted that in their mind, their focus is on something specific about the human biology. With women, they take eggs from their womb. With males, and it, this goes all the way back to Barney Hill, and everybody who's been abducted since Barney Hill, they've extracted male seed from these men. John Mack, Bud Hopkins, Countless others who have investigated the whole alien abduction phenomena say they're doing something with genetics, 
and the hybridization of aliens and human beings. Now, since we are Bible believers, we know, we know what that is. Daniel chapter 2, Ezekiel, Daniel, I passed it up. Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he sees the kingdoms. And the fourth kingdom is a kingdom mingled of iron and clay together, which doesn't really mingle together very well. We found out you can't weld iron to clay. It just doesn't work. And this won't work either. So in Daniel chapter 2, uh, verse 43, whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with my clay. And so when I hear about all of these alien abduction stories and about how they are preoccupied with taking eggs and seed from human beings, mixing them with the aliens. And I mean, there are lots of stories of women who have had abduction experiences, find out they're pregnant. And about three or four months into their pregnancy, they're abducted again, and all of a sudden the baby's gone. And some cases, these women are shown their babies are hybrids between the aliens and the humans. They're shown this, which matches perfectly what we see in Daniel chapter 2, verse 43. So the reason why I bring all this up is, is that when she was younger and the aliens abducted her, took her, they said, well, she's not ready yet. Now that she's 13, she's reached puberty. Now the aliens say, okay, she's at the right age. Why? Because now she becomes literally a fertile human being. All right? She's reached adolescence, so she's taken, and this is what's interesting to me, because where we're going to end up it, with this whole Betty Andreessen thing is I'm going to show you an initiation ritual that happened with her, and I'm sort of taking the long way to get there, because I'm going to show you some things that happened to her between um, when she was young and then when she was initiated. So right now, this part of the story, she's being led through caverns. And you wouldn't necessarily think that these would be on some planet somewhere or some moon in outer space or something in galaxies far, far away. Seems to be like this would be literally in the heart of the earth. And she sees all these crystal coffin-like structures and she sees all these people like in suspended animation, and they are in different costumes, different clothes, and she can tell they are, from, they are people who have lived at some time in human history, and these aliens have kept them there for whatever, like a museum or something like that. And I know this is weird. And here's the thing. I'm going to show you something in a little bit about what Betty has to do and it's going to sound weird. And everything about alien abductions and especially the Andreessen case, there seems to be no human logical reason why they're doing some of the things they're doing. It's almost like they're making this up, making this as outlandish as they possibly can. And it has no meaning whatsoever. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. So she's in this crystal cave. She sees all these people in these coffins and suspended animation. And then when she comes out of that, this is what happens. After leaving the cavern of crystal, Betty finds herself in front of what she literally calls a sea of glass. Does that ring a bell to anybody? She is told to step on crystal blocks, which when she does, they immediately attach to her feet. Now she begins walking on a sea 
of glass. And you notice here, these crystal blocks have inside of them some sort of light that as soon as she puts her feet on them, they immediately attach to her feet and the light lights up. And she has to walk now with these crystal blocks on her feet. Why? And she even asks why. Why do I have to put these on? You know what the answer the aliens gave her? It's necessary. Really? Why is it necessary? And I mean, this is just weird stuff. I mean, if you're going to make up a story like this, you wouldn't make this sounds so outrageously weird so that no one would believe you. So apparently the most weirdest thing that could happen did happen. And when Betty Andreessen asks, why do I have to walk with these crystal blocks on my feet? They just say, it's necessary. So she goes along with it. But to me, it was interesting. She's in this crystal world now crystal trees, crystal flowers, crystal grass, crystal rivers, and she's walking on a sea of glass like crystal. Does that ring a bell? Yes. Revelation 4. In fact, let's go to Revelation 4. I have Revelation 4, 6 up on the screen, but let's get the gist of it. Uh, Revelation 4, John is caught up. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. I know who that one is. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. I love that. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne. That's the glory of the Lord in the sight like unto an emerald. That's similar to what Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel chapter 1. So then in uh, verse 4, round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed with white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, what I have up on the screen is where we're going to see the sea of glass. Revelation 4, 6. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. So what John is seeing is the throne of God in heaven. God sitting on that throne. You got the 24 elders surrounding it. You have the seven spirits of God and underneath the throne on this firmament is a sea of glass clear as crystal. And that is exactly what Betty Andreessen said that she saw and walked on. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I have no idea what that means. Is it possible the aliens are sort of in aliens and devils, are they trying to make Andreessen comparable to walking in the presence of God on the sea of glass, clear as crystal, or like Jesus who walked on water? I don't know. They don't explain it. Betty Andreessen doesn't explain it. I'm not going to explain it. I just see the connection and I think, that's weird. When Solomon built his temple, he put a sea of glass where the Ark of the Covenant was going to be. Second Chronicles chapter 4, verse 2. Also, he made a molten sea of 10 cubits from brim to brim, round in compass, and 5 cubits the height thereof. And a line of 30 cubits did compass it round about, and under it was the similitude of oxen, which did compass it round about, 10 in a cubit compassing the sea round about two rows of oxen were cast when it was cast. It stood upon 12 oxen, three looking toward the north, three looking toward the west, three looking toward the south, and three looking toward the east. And the sea was set above them, and all their hinder parts were inward. And so here you have a double witness saying that 
wherever the sea of glass is, is where the throne of God is, the Ark of the Covenant, because that's where Solomon put it. He made that sea of glass, had those four oxen holding that base up. That was like the four living creatures in Ezekiel and, and Revelation 4. And then he puts the Ark of the Covenant right on top of that. And here Betty Andreessen is walking there. So then that takes us to Ezekiel 28 because we have Lucifer, the prince of Tyrus, prince of the power of the air, um, the god of this world, Satan, the dragon. There's all kinds of names for him. We have him wanting to possess God's throne. And look at what it says in Ezekiel 28 too. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not a God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. So where it says there, um, in the midst, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, that's a reference to the sea of glass, clear as crystal, that the throne of God sits on, and of course, Lucifer wants to sit on that throne. The body equivalent to that is, if you remember, the four-chamber heart is the four living creatures. That's where the throne of God is, and it's surrounded by a sea of glass, the pair of cardium, which is a sack of water that insulates the hearts, that surrounds the heart, like the sea of glass surrounds the throne with the four living creatures. So again, I see a sea of glass and I see Betty Andreessen with these crystal block shoes with this light in the middle of it, walking across this sea of glass and I'm just going, what in the world is going on here? It's weird, it's bizarre, it's crazy. About the closest thing that I can come to for an explanation is that I really do believe that Betty Andreessen was taken into the spiritual realm, fourth dimension, whatever you want to call it. And apparently in the spiritual realm, no matter where you are, when you have a body of water like a lake or an ocean or a stream or whatever, it is literally a sea of glass clear as crystal. So the best that I can come up with is that she actually um, went into the fourth dimension, the spiritual realm. And when she asks the aliens why she's being taken there, the aliens sort of tell her that they are the watchers over the earth. They're the protectors of nature. And that they all serve a being that they call the one. Now, I'm going to say a lot more about the one as we move through this because it's very, very important. If you were to just take a guess at who the one would be, and I'll go ahead and say this to you, it's not Jesus Christ. So if you were to just take a wild guess at who the one would be, you might be right. Talking about weird things, it just seems like these abductions of Betty Andreessen and her memories of everything that happened, they just went out of their way to show her how weird this place was, how wondrously magical it was. 
the interview that I just listened to from um, John Mack and Bud Hopkins about the uh, abductees, contactees, experiencers, there's different names for them. They're divided. Some of them say, I hate this in my life. I wish it had never happened. I can't stop it. I want it to stop and I'm powerless against it, but I absolutely hate it. It's destroyed my life. Some people actually commit suicide. But then you have people who when they're shown this alleged planet that these aliens come from, they see such wondrous things that number one, they never want to leave. And number two, even though they have to leave, they can't wait to the next time that they get abducted so they can go back to this wonderful place again. People, it's a setup. These devils, which is what they are, are setting these people up, giving them a false fantasy world that they say that they can have or they can achieve or whatever. They're telling Betty Andreessen that they're taking her home. Home to this beautiful crystal planet. And as she's walking along, remember, she's got these uh, crystal blocks on her feet that light, like light-up shoes. I wonder if that's where they came from, because all this happened in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Dun, dun, dun. Let me show you this. She sees a, a butterfly, and it was glass or ice-like, and it was motionless, colorless, and very delicate. She touched the butterfly with her finger. The butterfly turned to life when I touched it and flew for a short period of time. The colors were vibrant, blue, black, green. Then the color began to disappear and the butterfly stopped. The form disappeared and a bright blue, white, tiny spark appeared in a flash. And it seemed like a drop of water. And from the drop of water, this crystal butterfly formed again. So she sees this crystal butterfly, she touches it, all of a sudden it comes to life. Vibrant colors flying around, and then it stops, turns into a little drop of water, and when it drops, it turns back into this. And she's just fascinated by this. Oh wow, what a wonderful place. Now remember, she pretends to be a Bible-believing Christian. And I think these aliens are taking her and showing her signs and wonders to get her to believe this amazingly fascinating place that she is a part of. She's the lucky one, the chosen one who gets to experience all of this stuff here and it's weird. Here's a little bit of the conversation that Betty has with Ray Fowler, who is giving her the hypnotist regression. Um, she asked, I asked him, what's happening? He says, this is for you to remember so mankind shall understand. Fred Max, who is the interviewer, says, yes. Betty says, and I said, but why did it turn color and fly away when I touched it? He told me that I will see when I get home. Fred Mack says, did you ask anything else? Betty said, he said, home is where the one is. Fred says, and did you say, who is the one or anything like that? Betty says, he says, we're drawing closer to home where the one is. Oh, it's so beautiful in here. And we're walking along. And as you walk, it seems like that little one, that person there, uh, his foot lights that glass things underneath the lights. How come we have to have these things on our feet? I asked him, and he says, they're necessary. Now take a look at this. This is, and this is Betty Andreessen's own artwork. She just happens to be a, a fairly talented artist. And as she's doing these regressions, she can't, she's having trouble describing what she's seeing. So the hypnotist says, 
here's a piece of paper and a pencil. Why don't you draw it out for us? And she does. And she draws this amazing, beautiful crystal world. And everything's absolutely lovely. She's being sucked into this. She's being drawn into this with some sort of fairy tale land, a replacement for heaven that, number one, is probably not even real. Number two, it's not a place that she will ever spend eternity in. It's all a facade like a movie set. You think you're seeing a city, but you're not. You're either looking at computer graphics or you're looking at the, the front of a building and there's nothing behind it because it's part of a movie set. And that's what they're showing her. So now they lead her to this place here. This is called the Great Door. Take a look at it. She drew this. It says layers of thick, clear glass. Walls rolled upward and were of glass. And she says, I came out of me, and a shell of me stood motionless. So let me explain what happens. She gets to this set of crystal doors, glass doors. She's standing there, and all of a sudden, her soul walks out of her body and separates. Weird. Weird stuff. There's a thing called astral projection. I actually talked to a man who, in his childhood, practiced astral projection. He said, you just go into this meditation thing and you leave your body. Now, I don't necessarily believe that actually happens. I think that is something that devils imprint into the minds of people to make them think that they are leaving their bodies. Because we know one thing from the scriptures, that to be actually absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. The moment that our soul literally leaves our body we're going to go before the Lord either to be judged and sent to heaven or judged and sent to hell. But this is how she's describing it. So she goes and stands in front of these, all, it's all these doors there. She has to go through all of them. And they're telling her, you're going here to see the one. Now here's the transcript of what is happening at this scene. Betty says, I was told to come forward. I went in the door, and it's very bright. I can't take you any further. Hypnotist says, why? Betty says, because. Fred says, what do you mean because? Betty says, I can't take you past this door. Fred says, okay, I'll tell you what. You go past that door alone, then for a few minutes, okay? Time and again, Fred tried in different ways to induce Betty to tell him what was behind the door, all in vain. Fred says, sometimes maybe if you change your mind, would you tell me? Betty says, I can't change my, pine, my mind. It is set. Fred says, what would happen if you did tell me? Betty says, I can't tell you. I'm sorry. Fred, okay, let's proceed to the first thing you can tell me. Fair enough. Betty says, oh, Betty's face glows with joy. Fred says, what's happening? Betty says, I'm coming out of that door. And it was wonderful. Fred says, did the one say something exciting? Betty says, I can't tell you. I'm sorry. Fred says, would you say that the one was God? Betty says, do you really know what God is? Fred says, I don't know. I was hoping that you had seen him and could therefore tell me. Fred says, go on. Betty says, and we're floating along. Fred says, and you're not walking, you're floating, go on. Betty says, we're coming up to this wall of glass and a big, 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 big door, it's made of glass. Fred says, does it have hinges? She says, no, it is so big and there is, I can't explain it, it's a door and after a door and after a door and after a door. He is stopping there and telling me to stop. I'm just stopping there and he says, now you shall enter the door to see the one and he says, Fear not. Then Betty appeared to undergo an out-of-body experience. 
Betty says, and I'm standing there and I'm coming out of myself. There's two of me. There's two of me there. Fred says, are you looking at yourself? Betty says, uh-huh. Fred says, do you feel as if you were in both bodies? Betty says, no, that one over there is like, um, Fred says, like what? Betty says, that one over there, it's like a twin, but it's still like those people I saw in those, those ice cubes. Talking about those crystal coffins, she says. In other words, a motionless copy of you. Betty says, yes. Fred says, okay, do you see the one yet? Betty says, the one? No. Fred says, okay, go on. Betty says, I'm coming up to the door, and the little person is saying, now you shall enter the great door and see the glory of the one, and I'm standing face to face with that door. Then Betty became very puzzled. Now, I have to tell you, the first time I saw the reference to the door, I immediately thought of my Bible and what it said, or let's say my Bible and who it says the door is. And it has nothing to do with what Betty Andreessen saw that day. The real door is Jesus Christ. Revelation 4, 1, after this, and looked, I, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will shew thee things which must be hereafter. John chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So, we believe as Christians that Christ is the door or in other words, the way that you and I can enter into the glorious kingdom of God. We must enter in through the door, Jesus Christ. So what was the door that Betty Andreessen went into? I have a theory on this one. And it has to do with the human mind. Because I believe that God designed our brains, and it's a very complicated thing, and I think the Bible actually gives us a lot of what the mind is made of, how it works, and so on. I think it's all contained in the Bible. I think the thoughts that when, when you're hearing in you know, reading the Bible and hearing preaching of the Word of God, Jesus opens the door of our mind so that we can accept the things that are being preached to us. He's the door. When the devil wants to talk to us, he never, he knows he can't get through the door because Jesus won't let it in. So the devil always tries some other way to get in to our brain, subconsciously, like, um, you know, like magicians that do tricks or subliminal advertising or things like that. The devil always comes in some other way. And I believe that there is a doorway in our minds called sobriety. And that door remains shut. And what it's doing, it's keeping out devils and the influence of devils and the things that the spirits, the evil spirits in this world want to put into our minds. And so there's a way to open that door. Some people use alcohol. Some people use drugs. Some people use meditation. So once that door gets opened, then all kinds of ideas and things get poured into the human mind that probably should have never gone in there. Aldous Huxley wrote a book about this called The Doors of Perception because Aldous Huxley theorized 
just like I said, that our mind has a door in it, and that door is preventing good ideas from coming into our minds from the universe, I guess, or something like that. So Aldous Huxley said, you know, if I take a small amount of, like, LSD, well, that opens the door, and all of a sudden I get all these wonderful ideas. Let me tell you something. Most of the time, you can spot dope smokers a mile away. They say, you know, you don't judge a book by its cover, but I'm telling you, people who do drugs on a regular basis, there's a look about them. They think differently. They talk differently. They dress differently. They act differently differently even when they're not right at that time on drugs it alters their mindset and their worldview and they are just different people and Christians I want you to get used to that because that's the world we live in right now we just legalized medical marijuana in the state of Missouri and I'll tell you a psychiatrist in Main Street of Festus opened up a shop advertised for people to come, he would give them a medical marijuana card. You know what he did? He, came, he made up this little sheet of paper that said it's a questionnaire, and it asked them things like, do you ever feel anxiety? Have you ever felt depressed? Have you ever been worried about something? And it actually told them on the paper that they had to score a minimum of 10 in order to get a marijuana card. So what are people doing? They're going to make sure their score is at least a 10 or above. And they had, had hundreds of people lined up. They had them lined up all the way out the sidewalk, waiting to get in. Paid this guy $100. He looked at their thing, said, yep, you need medical marijuana. And they got a medical marijuana card. It was that simple. And these people now, their mindset is going to be altered for life. Okay, I did a Watchman video broadcast on this a while back called Chemical Sorcery. You ought to go watch it. Because I talk about things like this and how these mind-altering drugs, they do just that. They alter the mind. Not just while you're on the drug, but forever after that. You're changed. You're different. You think different. You see things differently in this world. So here's what Aldous Huxley said. Huxley believed that there were doors of perception in man's mind that remain closed and less open by either meditation or through psychoactive drugs such as mescaline or ayahuasca. These doors keep us from seeing truths such as our real selves, the universe, and how everything is connected together. And I want you to think about that. Everything connected together. So instead of there being 40 quadrillion things in the universe, since they're all connected together, then what is there in the universe? Just the one. You see it? I can tell you that in most UFO conferences, most UFO stories, most UFO accounts, most abduction accounts, everything, they're always telling everybody that everything in the universe is connected. Everything is. Every body, every plant, every rock, every space dust, every spaceship, every alien, we're all connected together. We're all the one. And that's the occult, new age, satanic, hellish doctrine that pervades this whole UFO thing. Betty Andreessen is seeing it right there in front of her eyes. What's happening with her is the same way that Aldous Huxley is describing. The purpose of these doors is that she is opening her mind up now to a new reality, a new consciousness, a new knowing. And once she goes through that door, she'll never come back to the reality of following Jesus Christ. Now, she still says she's a Christian. I don't buy it for a second, not for a second. So she goes behind the door. The door is the door of perception, the door of the subconscious, the door of 
like people who take ayahuasca. Um, let me show you this. Uh, Huxley inspired Francis Crick to use microdoses of LSD in order to focus on the chemical makeup de and design of DNA. That's how Francis Crick figured out how DNA was like two serpents. He was taking LSD because his friend was out as Huxley and his, Huxley said, you got a door closed. That's why you can't figure out what DNA is made of and how it looks. If you'll take this little bits of LSD, it'll open a door and you'll be able to see it clearly. And that is exactly what happened. Jim Morrison, rock and roll singer, right? What was this group called? The Doors. And he did that on purpose. He called it that after Aldous Huxley's idea, the doors of perception, that once that door is opened, now your mind is opened to the satanic spirits putting ideas in your mind and you are forever altered. It would be a miracle of God if he was ever to bring you back to sobriety. Miracle of God. I believe it can happen. But for the most part, never will. John chapter 10, verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and of love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. See, God's remedy to this is the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, the shield of faith, not sleeping, not activating the pineal gland so we fall asleep. They call that an awakening. But sobriety is the answer to that. And God will give you a far greater knowledge of anything you wanted to know that is far superior to anything the devil wants to put in your mind by you opening up that door of perception. I guarantee you God's way is better. Titus 2.12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. 1 Peter 1.13, wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 4.7, but the end of all things is at hand, be ye therefore sober, and watch unto prayer. So here you have Betty Andreessen. She's fixing to go through a door and see the one. She's fixing to be altered in her mind permanently. The aliens are taking her there to meet the one. And it's funny because the hypnotist tried dozens of ways once she went back there to get him to get her to tell him what it was she saw back there, what she heard, describe it, and she says, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. She was under some sort of mental block by these alien devils that would not allow her to reveal what she saw back there. It was forbidden. You see, what that is, is a mystery cult where you have this God called the One and Betty Andreessen's face to face with this God and sees all this wonder going on. And when she comes out, they said, what did you see? I can't tell you. I can't tell you. I'm not going to tell you. The opposite of that is Jesus telling all of us, his disciples, what I speak in your, your ear, you proclaim from the housetops. You tell everybody. We don't have two Bibles, an open one and a secret one that we never show anybody. We don't have that. 
everything that we are, everything that we believe, everything that we hope for, everything about God and His heaven is right here in this book plainly written out. But what Betty Andreessen experiences, shh, that's a mystery. That's a, we can, that's a secret. We can't tell anybody what that was. I mean, think about most experiencers, most UFO abductees. Almost without fail, they remember waking up in their bed. They remember seeing these three aliens enter into their bed. Next thing they know, they're laying back in their bed again, four hours later. Why did the aliens, why is it that every time they wipe the memories of these people so that they don't consciously remember what it was that happened. It's because the spirit over them is mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the mother of secrets. Shh, we can't tell anybody what happened. So here we have these verses telling us about sobriety and girding up the loins of our mind and having our mind straight so that we can tell the truth to the entire world. And then you have the medi... You've got to watch this PMO I did because these people had these serpents come in them and it made them fall backwards and they writhed around in their body like serpents goodness, it's awful. And there's no doctrine ex de describing that, explaining that. Nothing. It's just this power of these devils. Take a look at this. This article came out not too long ago. If you've met aliens while on DMT, these scientists would like to hear from you. The prestigious medical university at John Hopkins wants to know if you've ever taken... Uh, so much dimethyltryptamine, DMT, or I, like ayahuasca or things like that, that you've broken through reality and met the benevolent machine elves that live at the center of the universe. Research, researcher Roland R. Griffith is in the neuroscientist in charge of the study, and he's been on the forefront of scientific research into psychedelic experiences for decades. So they've got a study going that if you've ever taken ayahuasca, DMT, or whatever, and you met aliens. He wants to know about it. So it seems like now that there's two ways to meet aliens. Well, maybe three. You can do what Stephen Greer does. You can go out and chant and meditate and do Merkaba mysticism. Merkaba means chariot. And you can call the chariots down. Or you can just go to bed at night and hope to be abducted. Or you can take ayahuasca. Either way. You're going to meet these elves that we now call aliens. What does that tell you? They're not people who live on other planets who are having a scientific expedition here on planet Earth. These are spirits. Ayahuasca, DMT, is called the God molecule. You know why? The spirit molecule. Because when you take it, you see a God. You see a spirit. You see an alien. You see elves or fairies or serpents. or You see all kinds of weird stuff because you've opened that door. And that's what that door represents to Betty Andreessen. Now that she's gone through that door, she is forever altered. Here is a picture that they took of her when she is remembering going through this door. Look at her. Look at the bliss on her face. It's like she's in heaven, but she's not. Whatever place they took her, it was a trap. It was to get her to open up the door of her perception so that she would be forever altered. And she's doing this when she's like 13 years old. 
she goes to see the one. Now, um, yeah, yeah, let me show you this part. I don't think I'm going to get to the one this week. I've got two more big things to show you out of all of this. One of them involves the one that she sees. The other one involves the initiation. And I said it uh, on Pastor Mike online the other day, so I'll go ahead and say it now. Betty Andreessen had a ritual that involved a real living phoenix. Okay, that's where we're going with all of this. Let's read some more of the transcript of what's going on in this regression with when she saw the one. Betty says, uh, I'm in their place. I can't do anything. Fred says, okay, in a moment, you're going to go see the one, right? We don't want to waste the experience. We want to get the most out of it. See, he's trying to coax her into getting her to tell her what she saw and who the one is and what he said. So he, so he says, uh, I want you to ask yourself, what am I getting out of this? Why am I here? And what will this mean to me later on in my life? It's like any big experience a person is allowed to have. Okay, I want you to pr progress to where the door is open and you're seeing the one. Betty says, oh, that's when she's got that smile on her face. At that very moment, an indescribable smile came over Betty's face. The only adjective that I can think of to describe it is rapturous. This expression of pure, unrestricted happiness remained on Betty's face as Fred continued to question her. Fred, you seem happy. Why are you so happy? Betty, it's just, um, I just, I can't tell you about it. Fred, all right, I know you can't tell me, but I want you to do a few things. I want you to ask yourself why you're being shown that which you're being shown. In other words, you weren't given this trip just for a free ride, so to speak. They want you to see what you're seeing. Does that make sense, Betty? Yes, Fred. All right, now, now that you're here, ask yourself, what am I getting out of this? Why am I here? What am I supposed to be, what am I supposed to think about after I leave here? Betty says, oh, it matters not what I get from it. Fred, what do you mean? Betty says, it's, words can't explain it. It's wonderful. It's for everybody. I just can't tell you this. Fred says, you can't? Okay, why can't you? Betty says, for one thing, it's too overwhelming, and it is, it is undescribable. I just can't tell you. Besides, it's just impossible for me to tell you. Fred says, all right, are you capable when looking around you to tell yourself? Betty says, I understand it. I'm sorry. I just, I wish I could share it with you. Fred says, were you told not to share it with me? Betty says, it is like, even if I was able to speak it, I wouldn't be able to speak it. I can't. I'm sorry. Fred, were you specifically told not to speak it? Betty, partly. Yeah. Fred, how was it expressed to you? Betty, I can't tell you those things. I'm sorry. Fred, all right. Can we let the being speak through you? Stop right here. Can we let the being speak through you? You know what that is? demon possession Betty has you're going to read we're going to see it in a minute Betty has an experience right there in the hypnotist's office it's like she's regressed now she's like 13 years old she's going back I don't know 20 some odd years in her life and then all of a sudden they find out that the aliens that were with her back then are in the room with them right now. Watch this. Fred says, all right, can we let the being speak through you? Suppose you just relax and I'll put my hand on your shoulder. I will count from one to three. I will put my hand on your shoulder and with each number you will go deeper and deeper. When I reach three, you will just relax and allow the beings to speak through you. One, two, three. And then it says, Betty began to speak in a strange tongue. And there you see the picture of her. She's got her hands raised. Betty is speaking in an unknown language. How many church services have you seen where that goes on? People got their hand raised 
and they're speaking in an unknown tongue. Is that really? F Here she's got alien devils, not the Holy Spirit, alien devils giving her this rapturous experience. She's lifting her hands up and she's speaking in a tongue that no one understands. Do you know what that means? Do you know what that implies, what it indicates? She's not under the influence of the Holy Ghost in any way. She is under the influence of devils. 1 Corinthians 14, 13, Wherefore let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray, that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. So, Paul says, if it's really from God, and it's an unknown tongue, God will give you the interpretation. She speaks in this unknown tongue. They ask her, what did you just say? I can't tell you. Do you know what you said? Yeah, but I, I can't tell you. It's a violation. If this is from God, it's a violation of God's word. 1 Corinthians 14, 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. So since Betty spoke in this unknown tongue, and was not allowed to give an interpretation of it, that tells you right there it wasn't from God. It was from devils. And Betty Andreessen claims to be a Christian. 1 Corinthians 14, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience as also saith the law. I think they picked her for a reason. I think number one, they picked her because she was a woman. She is like a John the Baptist making the straight paths crooked in advance of the appearance and revelation of the antichrist. And her tongue speaking breaks every rule that's in 1 Corinthians 14 concerning the speaking in tongues. She just flat out refuses to give the interpretation and tell what it means. Now, God said that there is a group of, of devils that speak in an unknown tongue. Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28 is that covenant chapter. Um, let me give you a little bit of history. It is reported that when George Washington took the oath of office, when he took president, that he had the Bible opened to Deuteronomy 28. You'll read that, okay? And you'll understand a little bit about why he did that. It was God's covenant with the nation. If we keep God's laws, he'll bless us. If we don't, we're doomed. Ask yourself, are we keeping God's laws in this country? So Deuteronomy 28 says, when you don't keep my laws, statutes, and judgments, here's what I'm going to do. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth. As swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Jeremiah 5.15, same thing. Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from far, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. It is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose tongue thou knowest not, neither understandest what they say. So he says there in Deuteronomy 28 that he's going to bring them from the end of the earth. Take a look at this picture. This is known, see that line above the earth? That's known as the Carmen line. 
that's actually the line that people who are in the ISS, people who've been in the space shuttle, or anybody that's been up in space, they can see it. They can see a clear line where the atmosphere ends on the earth and space begins. And God said that he would bring that nation from the end of the earth, from space. And they would come speaking a tongue that no one understands. Now, in today's world, that's not even possible because we know every language now that's spoken all over the world. Somebody somewhere can translate it into your language. I guarantee you, Google can do it, although not very well right now, but they're working on it. So we're not talking about an earthly nation. We're talking about a nation of devils that speak a language that nobody knows. And Betty Andreessen is their prophet. They're John the Baptist. Getting to meet the one behind the great door. People who have UFO experiences, I've, I mean, I've watched a lot of videos, read books, uh, one guy in particular said that, you know, he had seen a UFO early in his life, and then he went to work for the United States government, working for the Department of Defense, working for the CIA, doing security work. He says that he went into an underground facility and saw that we were trying to reverse engineer an alien spacecraft said it altered his entire perception of the world because up until then he was just thinking you know this is our world God made it and we're the only ones here now he sees a ship that he knows did not come from any place in this world and now his mind is altered forever and some people freak out some people when they find out actual evidence of UFOs and aliens they literally cannot handle it that door of perception it's got to stay closed they may accuse you of being closed-minded there's nothing wrong with that as long as all you're letting in is your knowledge of the Word of God. And I would say to you people that I believe that we're coming to a time when everybody in the world is going to be confronted with this fourth kingdom, these alien devils, possibly their ships, their chariots, their wheels, the Ophanum, the Gilgalim, there's other words for them. Merkaba, the chariots are coming. They're going to be confronted with this, and it's going to freak their mind out. God's people are going to be settled and solid and standing on that day in the Word of God. That's why I do what I do. To tackle issues like this that I don't know nobody else seems to want to talk about but I think it's relevant and I think it's biblically relevant and I hope to be able to share as much as I can with you and give you as much of the Word of God as I can so that you're grounded rooted anchored and when the winds of the, all these false things are going to happen, when they start blowing, you're going to be steady as the rock of ages. Okay? All right. Next week, we're going to meet the one. Find out who that is. Okay? You probably have already figured it out. Betty was told it was Jesus, the Creator. 
It's not. I promise you, it's not. All right? I love you. You're the reason why I do what I do. Believe me in that. Keep us in your prayers. We thank you for your love and your support. May the Lord bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.